Tanse, I'm Chris Nachkete. Welcome to APTN National News. A community is in mourning uh, in northern Manitoba today after a non-verbal six-year-old child went missing last week and was found deceased over the weekend. Last Wednesday on September 18th, six-year-old Johnson Redhead in Shamatawa First Nation went missing after he went to his school's breakfast program but didn't show up to class after. A large-scale search began for five days, led by community members, Canadian Rangers, RCMP Search and Rescue, the Office of the Fire Commissioner, Tatasquayak, Mantosipi and Pimichikamak Cree Nations. A helicopter, a police search dog, infrared drones were also brought in. Sadly, on Sunday at 7.45 p.m., Shimatua RCMP said the six-year-old was found deceased in a marshy area just three and a half kilometers from his school. Meanwhile, the Flying Dust First Nation in Saskatchewan is trying to understand the sudden loss of a loved one over the weekend. According to the RCMP, last Saturday in Meadow Lake at 4.15 a.m., an officer saw two people operating an ATV without helmets. The officer activated emergency lights and tried to stop the ATV, but it sped off down the Highway 55 towards Flying Dust First Nation. The officer says he turned off his lights and did not pursue, but saw the ATV turn off the highway and hit the ditch. The officer responded and called EMS to try and save one person on scene who was unresponsive. Sadly, a 14-year-old female from Flying Dust was declared dead by EMS. The second occupant had minor injuries. Meadow Lake RCMP and the Saskatchewan Coroner Service are investigating. The community of South Bank near Burns Lake, BC is breathing a huge sigh of relief after a non-verbal six-year-old girl who was missing for more than three days was found safe Sunday evening. This cell phone video caught the moment of when six-year-old Oakland Schweder was found safe and sound and back in the arms of her mother. The girl went missing from her home in South Bank, BC, near Burns Lake on Thursday night. She was not wearing any shoes. RCMP says Schweder was found in a forested area between her residence and the band office that was previously searched, leaving searchers to believe she was likely moving around. More than 600 people helped police with the search. The child had no visible injuries and is in good condition but was taken to hospital as a precaution. Gail Skin, the mother of Oakland, took to Facebook to thank all the searchers and supporters. We just wanted to come on here and personally thank everyone and that um, we're going to burn sake right now so she can get properly checked out. Oh my goodness, you guys, oh, everyone was saying this is the day Oak was going to come back and she came home, she came back. Local First Nations have come forward with a creative new way to allow people to buy homes in Vancouver at an affordable price. This is the site of the Heather Lands, a partnership between the Musqueam, Squamish and Sailwatu Sail Nations and the provincial government. The project is unique in that buyers will only need to come up with financing for 60% of the property's value. The province will finance the other 40%. This attainable housing initiative is something that was conceived by our nations. It is a true, it's truly innovative in uniquely, in, 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 in uniquely indigenous approach to development. 14 First Nations on Vancouver Island are under a state of emergency. They say the provincial and federal governments have failed in reversing the course of the overdose and mental health crisis. As a result, the Nuchanut Tribe Council is asking for funding so it can lead the response to the crisis itself. CTV's Anna McMillan reports. These are mothers, fathers, Gathered in a formal residential school building, members of the Nuchalnath Tribal Council still bear the weight of what happened here. 
and we're all suffering from the intergenerational trauma that happened right here, right in this very building that we're standing in. That pain is manifesting as a mental health and opioid crisis. And now the New Chalnuth Tribal Council is declaring a state of emergency in all 14 of its member nations. Funerals that used to be once a month have now gone to two to three a week. There has been a string of losses, including a death in a house at First Nation that police say is suspicious. You know, the call for mental health support has been really appreciated on behalf of the families and the community members that have been affected by this. New Chalnuth territory spans much of Vancouver Island's west coast, a huge swath of land that the Tribal Council says has few resources for people who are suffering. We've seen British Columbia declare a state of emergency eight years ago on this, and what has changed? So maybe it's time to change hands. We just want to lead it. They're asking the provincial and federal governments to fund various resources, including detox beds and crisis supports, along with improved emergency services for remote communities such as a house it. We're looking at approximately an hour and a half for, from time of a call to be able to actually get true medical service to our people. Island Health says it's moving forward with plans to offer sobering and assessment services in Tofino, and it also has plans for up to 10 recovery beds in Port Alberni. We're asking British Columbians to ask their candidates running in this next provincial election, what are you going to do about it? In the face of such agony, there is hope. I think by embracing and sharing the love and the teachings and the strength with our children as they prosper and grow into healthy, strong adults, that they'll, they'll carry that work forward naturally. Work they say must happen urgently so no one else is lost. Anna McMillan, CTV News. As Parliament has now resumed, the First Nations Clean Water Act continues to be studied. The House of Commons Indigenous Affairs Committee heard from witnesses from two Cree nations, Annette Francis brings us more from Ottawa. Hermes and Cree Nation leadership, along with their lawyer Clayton Leonard, were the first witnesses at the early morning committee. A week ago, the community reactivated a 10-year-old lawsuit in order to push the federal government to recognize they have a human right to safe drinking water. As Councillor Mackinaw has pointed out, uh, Hermes has lived over the decades with the repeated experience of various governments saying we're going to fix this and now yet again Canada is promising best efforts in the bill. The reality is 73 percent of homes at Ermanskin today are under drinking water advisories. So the intent of the lawsuit is? To make sure everyone at Ermanskin can turn on the tap and not have to worry about their drinking water anymore and to get confirmation in a court of law that First Nations have a right to safe drinking water. Okay. I think if that went in the bill, then it would help move the lawsuit towards a resolution. And that's the next question. If it's in the legislation, does the lawsuit stop? Would you drop the lawsuit if that amendment was there? If Canada is actually willing to implement the right to safe drinking water. Later in the meeting, Miccosu Cree Nation Chief Billy Joe Takaro joined by video conference. He stated that Bill C-61 should be dropped and Canada needs to instead respect the treaties. People have to understand where, where, we, where, we, where we're situated in northeastern Alberta. The people have to remember we're, we're situated downstream from oil sands. And, and, and that's the reason why this, this, uh, this bill might work for the rest of Canada because we know for a fact Alberta will always have their hands in the bucket in regards to water and what they and what they do in regards to how they uh, what they need to, to develop the the resources so that's the reason why I'm saying that we we, we are in total um, uh, opposition of this bill the committee will resume its study of Bill C-61 next week. And at Francis APTN National News, Ottawa. The Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations in Saskatchewan is going to the polls this fall. We'll bring you an update on who's running. We're back in about three minutes. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Yukon Territorial Government says they've started constructing a safety berm at the Eagle Gold Mine site near the community of Mayo.
The mine previously owned by Victoria Gold experienced a heap leach failure in June. The failure caused a landslide, resulting in cyanide being released into the surrounding environment. The mine is now in receivership. Officials say the berm will be built across the slide area and the site's access road. Once completed, it will allow construction crews to install groundwater and interception wells near the slide area. They say the focus now is finishing emergency remediation work before the winter. Making sure that the, the pipes and the pumps are all insulated, making sure that the water treatment plant has buildings around the reverse osmosis units, ensuring that we are able to, to convey water around the site in winter conditions. So there's a lot of work that's being done by the team on site, identifying everything that has to occur, and that's one of the, the primary work packages that are going on right now. The Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations in Saskatchewan is holding a round of elections on October 31st. Up for grabs are the chief and the first and third vice chief positions. Incumbent FSIN chief Bobby Cameron and first vice chief David Pratt announced their intent to run last Friday in Saskatoon. Video journalist Rachel May has more. First Vice Chief David Pratt is hoping to be re-elected for a third term. He says the FSIN has been successful in advocating for families affected by the child welfare system, something he says will continue with him in office. We're going to go after the provinces and territories for what they've done to our families and to our children and make sure that they're held accountable for the treatment of our young people. Next up, current FSIN Chief Bobby Cameron. He served three terms and is now seeking a fourth. Unlike other First Nations groups, the FSIN does not limit the number of terms one can serve in office. By now, you've all known who we are and what we're about. You know our character. You know our behavior. You know our attitude. Our heart and mind is in the right place to serve for you under the FSIN, the strongest Indian organization, the strongest treaty Indian organization in Canada. Cameron left the event early for a funeral on Beardies and Okimasis Cree Nation, but he stressed the importance of sober living. Unfortunately, all of you know what we deal with on a weekly basis. Sometimes on a daily basis, we're dealing with a deadly demon every day. Alcohol, cocaine and meth. Before leaving, he took a moment to answer questions from media. Chief Cameron has a 1993 conviction for break and enter and theft. FSIN regulations prohibit candidates with fraud or theft convictions from running for office. When asked about this, Chief Cameron stated he has never hid his past in previous elections. So this happened over 30 years ago. I submitted my documents and the credential committees will meet I'm assuming October 1st, because that's when we leave office, October 1st, and they'll decide. Regarding the federal audit of the FSIN, Cameron says he is unsure of anyone's status in the investigation. Next week, 3rd Vice Chief Ali Bear will announce her intent for re-election. Rachel May, APTN National News, Saskatoon. The National Day for Truth and Reconciliation is a week from now. AP10 will have extensive coverage on September 30th and in the days ahead of Orange Shirt Day. Here's a preview from T.R. Wheatley about the Truth and Reconciliation Witness Blanket being welcomed home to the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. This West Coast um, artist created this witness blanket in 2014. Carrie Newman, my traditional name is Hyald Kingdome. A decade later, his work now given a permanent home in this National Museum. Residential school history deserves a place um, amongst all of those stories. Placing it in the international conversation around human rights. Ceremony wasn't always accepted inside these walls. Neither was the word genocide until 2019, causing many protests over the years. Well, over 10 years ago that I crashed a focus group for the development of the museum. A reflection from the institution and the lessons learned along the way. So part of our growth really has been to understand our own connection, our own relationship with land. Coming up during National Truth and Reconciliation Week here on APTN National News. 
Throughout the week, viewers have been heading over to our aptnews.ca website to answer our weekly web poll questions. Let's take a look at last week's results. First we asked, do you know how the federal carbon tax works? 42% said yes, with 38% saying no, while 38% weren't sure, and 2% saying, what's that? With Parliament back in session last week, we asked, should there be a federal election right now? 42% said yes, 42% disagreed and said no, and 13% said they aren't sure. And lastly, we asked, have you ever tried to use services available under Jordan's principle? If so, was it successful? An overwhelming 84% said no, 9% said yes, and it was successful, but 7% said yes, it wasn't successful. For those who voted and stay tuned for this week, brand new web questions at aptnnews.ca. We'll tell you about a new play that is bringing more awareness to residential schools. That story when we're back in less than three minutes. Stick around. Over on the East Coast, Charlottetown 15, Halifax 16. Cartwright 8, Legrand River 10. Gatsby 14, Seguene 16. Peterborough 19, London 20. Timmins 24, Sioux Lookout 14. Churchill 5, Thompson 9. Winnipeg 15, Princess Harbor 14. Yorkton 11, Saskatoon 12. 10 in LaRange, Stony Rapids 3. Fort McMurray 17, High Level 14. Lethbridge 24, Sunny and Medicine Hat at 23. Tofino 16, Kamloops 27. 20 in Prince George, Fort Nelson 15. Mayo 11, Dawson 9. Yellowknife 13, Norman Wells 13 as well. Colville Lake 9, Inuvik 8. 8 in Chesterfield, Baker Lake 8 as well. Clyde River 9, and Iglulik 4. A play that imagines a group of Indigenous youth at a residential school putting on a production of Shakespeare's All's Well That Ends Well is set to hit the stage in Toronto. Initially produced in 2022 at the Stratford Festival, the play 1939 was born of both Family Legacy and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and has been guided by Indigenous elders, survivors and ceremony throughout its development. For more on the play, we're joined by actors Richard Como and Grace LaMarche, who spoke to our Dennis Ward. Richard, Grace, thanks so much for taking some time for us here out of your busy schedule. Uh, Richard, let's uh, start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about the play 1939? Sure. Um, the play takes place in the year 1939, which is uh, the year that the King and Queen of England have decided to make their trek across the ocean to come and visit Canada for the first time. Um, and for uh, the sake of the story of this play, they decided to come and visit this fictional uh, residential school. But the story really lies within the five Indigenous students at this residential school, and it really shows their resilience and how they band together to really help create uh, a play that is their own. Uh, Grace, what's your take on the play, uh, your role and, and its impact? Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm playing Beth Summers in the play, which is one of the five students within the play. Um, and yeah, it's been really interesting dissecting what it means to be Indigenous in the setting that 1939 exists in and um, how to kind of explore indigeneity within that space. It's been really, really fun. Uh, now, Richard, this is your third run, I believe, uh, in various capacities with the play. Uh, what's been the reaction in the past, and uh, why is it an important production as we approach the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation? I think the reaction has generally been extremely positive. Uh, I think this is a very important piece to be 
uh, seen and told. This this is such an incredible story, and I, and I feel that um, it's a great step towards uh, people learning more about the history of Indigenous peoples within Canada and having a chance to then further their education and finding out more about uh, the situations and whatnot that happened with these people that did go to these schools. Yeah, Grace, uh, what do you hope audiences, Indigenous but also non-Indigenous uh, audience members take away from 1939? Um, I hope that audiences, um, I guess, gain a better understanding of what Indigenous resilience is instead of, um, you know, I guess, looking at stories like this as a very, um, I don't want to say somber, but, you know, as something that um, is almost too much to look into. You know, I'd love for people to come in and see how, um, how strong and resilient the children in this school are and how that carries on through um, everyone who has come out of that system and how um, indigeneity is con like constantly evolving and um, how we're able to explore that today. Grace, how did you uh, come to be involved with the play? So it's actually a funny story. Um, at the beginning of this year, um, I was part of a like creative mentorship program through the Paprika Festival, which is in Toronto. And Janie, the director and co-playwright of 1939, was paired with me as my mentor. Um, so I actually had the opportunity to sit in on a rehearsal in Sudbury, and that's where I met Richard for the first time, um, just to kind of see Janie do her thing, and it was amazing. Um, and then as time progressed, I, I got a call and I was offered the role of Beth Summers for the Toronto and British Columbia shows. So in the winter, if you told me that I would be involved in this project the way I am now, I would I would think you were crazy. But it's it's been a really, really incredible and surprising journey. Well, congrats to you. Um, you know, uh, Richard, the play is only opening on Friday, but I understand that it's already, its run's been extended. Uh, uh, something that's uh, clearly resonating with people there. Yeah, absolutely. We've been told that the tickets are, are selling quite quickly and it's it's super exciting to know that we've been extended until the, the 12th of October. Um, and then be taking the show to the Belfry Theatre in Victoria BC as well. And I think it's fantastic that uh, Toronto audiences are really making an effort to see uh, this incredible story and to just support Indigenous plays. Indigenous theater. Awesome stuff. Well, Grace, Richard, again, thanks for uh, taking some time to talk to us about it all and all the best with the run. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Happy. Miigwech. Yeah, miigwech. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. And that's your midday newscast for this Monday, September 23rd. We'll be back in a few hours for your evening newscast. Make sure to join us then. From everyone at APTN National News, Masicho, hi, hi, miigwech. Thank you for watching. Exe.